Hey everyone, I'm Jensen. Today is Friday, December 11th, and from a plane landing on the Ohio Turnpike to another rejected lawsuit regarding the 2020 election, I have all the stories you need to know to get in the loop tonight. But first, I just want to say happy Friday. I don't know if it's been a long week for anyone else, but maybe it's maybe it's just been the, the cloudy skies out there. Who knows? But tomorrow, those clouds bring with it quite a bit of rain. According to our first alert weather team, a Saturday soaker is on the way with rain showers throughout the day, with the heaviest rain coming in sometime at midday. Now, a wind shift Saturday night into early Sunday will push temperatures back down into the 30s. But besides a brief touch of snow on Wednesday, the rest of the week next week seems to be pretty quiet for us. And while we are still looking at Northwest Ohio, Look at this, let's talk about that plane landing. A small single engine airplane made an emergency landing on the turnpike just this afternoon. And this was just east of the Swanton Post near the Fulton Lucas County Road overpass. Now, thankfully there were no injuries, the plane wasn't damaged, and Trooper said there wasn't even really a disruption to traffic. But eventually that plane did have to be towed to the Toledo airport. Now we did get an update on COVID-19 in Ohio today. So let's just take a brief look at some of that data that we got from the health department. Today, there were 10,359 new cases of coronavirus compared to the 21 day average of 9,847. There are 128 new deaths compared to the 21 day average of 70. 394 new hospitalizations compared to the 21 day average of 361 and 44 new ICU admissions compared to that average of 37. So here I just want to point out a few quick notes. Uh, daily hospitalizations, total patients and then total ICU patients have all sort of leveled off this week. Total number of deaths also stayed fairly flat, but it's staying flat at the highest point in the pandemic. So that is something else to keep in mind. Uh, total patients on ventilators, unfortunately, continues to rise. And confirmed cases did jump up again. And this is likely the beginning of the cases that we're seeing from Thanksgiving gatherings. So it's going to be something that we keep an eye on as we, as time goes on, basically, to see if that translates into other key points of data. Now, if all goes well, the city of Ohio will be getting its first shipment of the COVID-19 vaccine on Tuesday. The Ohio National Guard has been tapped to help prepare the state for the arrival and distribution of this vaccine. So let's look at what, what they've been up to, basically. Roughly two dozen Guard members have been working with the Ohio Department of Health to practice transferring empty glass vials into small boxes and then working out logistics to receive and repackage the vaccine for distribution. So they've been conducting these daily drills for several weeks to make sure that they can effectively handle the vaccine because the vaccine has to stay extremely cold, which puts a major time constraint on them. Basically, once it's shipped from the warehouse, it has to be taken out of the ultra cold storage and then repackaged with dry ice in less than two minutes. So, so they've been practicing to make sure that they can, they can keep up and do this effectively. Now, once the vaccine does get here in Ohio, who gets them first? Dwine announced phase 1A last week, but here's a quick refresher. Basically, up first are healthcare workers and personnel who work with COVID-19 patients, EMS responders, and then vulnerable individuals who live together in close proximity, and then the people who care for them. So some of those people include residents and staff at nursing homes, at assisted living facilities, patients and staff at state psychiatric hospitals, people with intellectual disabilities or mental illness who live in group homes along with their staff, and then uh, residents and staff at Ohio Veterans Homes. Now, state leaders won't know exactly how many doses are in each batch until it gets really close to the batch's shipment date, but basically here's what we're expecting on the 15th. We're looking at 9,750 Pfizer doses for Ohio hospitals, and then another 88,725 doses for Walgreens and CVS, and then the, those doses from Walgreens and CVS will be sent out to congregate settings like nursing homes. Now, with those first doses expected in less than a week, what is going on with this vaccine approval? Let's look at Pfizer's candidates. So last night, a U.S. government advisory panel endorsed widespread use of Pfizer's coronavirus vaccine, and the FDA could grant emergency use authorization for that candidate as early as Tonight. In fact, White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows has been pushing FDA Chief Stephen Hahn to grant an EUA for Pfizer's vaccine by the end of today. And President Donald Trump tweeted directly at Hahn early this morning complaining that the FDA is, quote, still a big old slow turtle. Soon after Trump's tweet, Hahn reportedly told Pfizer that the FDA will rapidly work to grant emergency use of its COVID-19 vaccine. 
And while the Trump administration is pushing for that to happen tonight, it's 7.45 right now as I'm shooting this, and so far there has been no such announcement. But really, this could come at any time. So as soon as we get more information, we'll be sure to let you know. And just in tonight, the Supreme Court has rejected a lawsuit in Texas backed by President Donald Trump to overturn Joe Biden's election victory. So the court's order was its second this week, turning down Republican requests to get involved in the 2020 election outcome. The justices had just turned away an appeal from Pennsylvania Republicans on Tuesday. Now, 106 members of Congress and multiple state attorneys general had signed on to this suit that was filed against Michigan, Georgia, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. So what exactly was this lawsuit? Well, the Texas Attorney General claimed the four battleground states ran illegal and unconstitutional elections, uh, exploiting the pandemic to justify unlawful changes that ignored federal and state election laws, although so far no evidence has been presented to prove these allegations. So he called on the court to invalidate the state's 62 total electoral college votes, which had all called Biden the winner. But again, at Right around 6.30 this evening, we got word that the Supreme Court did reject this case. And the Electoral College is set to meet Monday, so let's, let's look at a few common questions here. So who exactly are these electors? Basically, presidential electors are typically elected officials, political hopefuls, or a longtime party loyalist. Where do they meet and what do they do? Well, the Electoral College doesn't meet really in one place. Instead, each state's electors and the electors in DC meet in a place chosen by their legislature, which is generally the capital. So the election is really low tech. They use paper ballots to vote for the president and for the vice president. So the votes get counted and the electors sign six certificates with the results. Each certificate gets paired with a certificate from the governor detailing the state's vote totals. So those six packets then get mailed to various people specified by law, but the most important copy, the most important one to think about, uh, is the one that gets sent to the president of the Senate, the current vice president. So uh, this is the copy that will be officially counted later on. So do the electors have to vote for the candidate who won their state? Which is a good question. In 32 states and in DC, laws require electors to vote for the popular vote winner. The Supreme Court unanimously held up this arrangement in July. Uh, electors almost always vote for the state winner anyway, though, because they generally are devoted to their political party. Now, and a bit of an exception did happen back in 2016 when 10 electors tried to vote for other candidates. So those included people who pledged to support Clinton, uh, but who decided not to back her in an attempt to get Republican electors to abandon Trump and pick somebody else. Um, but that obviously did not did not work. Uh, what happens next? Well, once the electoral votes are cast, they're sent to Congress, where both houses will then convene on January 6th to pres uh, in a session that's presided over Pence. Uh, the envelopes from each state in the District of Columbia will be opened, and then the votes are tallied. And then, of course, after all of that said and done, Inauguration Day is on January 20th. Before I go, I have a great Florida man story for you, but this time it's not weird. It's actually very sweet. So as many Americans are struggling financially during the pandemic, one Florida business owner is trying to ease that burden by covering the utility bills for 114 families facing disconnection. Now, apparently this is something he's been doing since before the pandemic, uh, and it's actually his second year paying people's bills for the holidays. The 74-year-old said he relates to these families because he and his three daughters spent a Christmas in 1983 without heat or power. And it's for the same reason as the people he's helping. He basically said the bills were just too much. So in total, he's said to have spent $7,615.40 to help his community keep his lights on. And he was able to actually more than triple the number of families that he's helped this year from the 36 families he paid it forward to in 2019. So absolutely incredible. What a wonderful story of generosity as the holidays approach. But that is all I have for you today. If you like this video, hit that like button and of course subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm Jensen, I know you are in the loop.